Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is January 28, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 30. One evening last spring the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Southgate, Kentucky was packed with customers. They were enjoying a good time, and the troubles of the world outside seemed remote and forgotten for the moment. But in a room away from the crowds, fire broke out. It soon became apparent that the fire would spread to the rest of the club. Someone went on stage to warn the customers to leave. He called for attention and warned them in a calm voice that fire had broken out in another part of the club. He cautioned them against panic, but urged everyone to get up immediately and leave in an orderly manner while there was time to do so. A few people listened took him at his word, or at least decided better safe than sorry, and got up and left. But to his astonishment many did not listen at all, and most of those who did listen just laughed and went back to their merrymaking. After all, they could not see any flames nor even any smoke. And so the man redoubled his warnings, pleading with them to leave before the fire arrived, but to no avail. A few who had doubted at first now realized he was serious and got out, but many continued to ignore him. No flames, no smoke, so how could there be a fire? But then suddenly there was smoke, and a moment later fire. The fire spread rapidly. Panic broke out as people surged toward the doors. Soon the Beverly Hills Supper Club was a raging inferno and the loss of life was staggering. Meanwhile the few who had heard and heeded the warning stood outside, looking in awe at the horrible nightmare before them. My friends, I feel today like the man who tried in vain to give that warning to the patrons of the Beverly Hills Supper Club. Five years ago when I wrote my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, there was still time for an aroused American public to stave off disaster. Since that time I have tried through Congressional testimony, radio and television talk shows, lectures and tape recordings to wake up America in time. A few have listened and have even taken action in every way they could to help, and that makes the whole effort worthwhile to me personally. But most of us today will never bring ourselves to really believe our nation is threatened by the fires of nuclear war until we begin to be singed by the flames. As I speak to you today, the flames are already licking at our feet. The forces which were set in motion by our secret rulers decades ago have suddenly turned against them in recent months. Now they are trying frantically to stop some of the things they have launched, but it is too late. While they have been gambling over the years, the rulers in the Kremlin have been playing a shrewd game of chess, and now checkmate is upon us. What's more, a very important shift in power within the Kremlin ruling circles has taken place in recent weeks whose effect is to accelerate the possible demise of our once great land. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, the One World Plan of our Secret Rulers Gone Awry, Topic No. 2, the Aggressive New Policies of the Kremlin, and Topic No. 3, the Soviet Readiness to Police the World. Topic No. 1. It has now been a year and a half since the Soviet Union launched its all-out military double-cross of our own secret rulers. It all began with the Soviet underwater missile crisis of 1976, which I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 14 for July of that year. By two months later I was able to detail for you how public exposure of the Soviet threat even though that exposure was limited, played a key role in preventing for the moment a surprise nuclear attack by the Soviet Union. But once that attack was averted, our secret rulers tried to patch up their alliance with Moscow, 
thinking wrongly that they could keep the upper hand with the Russians until they had served their purpose. That alliance was part of the grand design, the long-range commitment to create a dictatorial one-world government that secretly was forged early in this century. So our unelected rulers kept right on trying to keep the limping alliance on its feet until disaster struck four months ago. On September 27, 1977, America lost the still secret but historic space battle of the Harvest Moon. Our ruler's military trump card, the secret American moon base in Copernicus Crater, was put out of action by the Soviet Union using an orbital neutron particle beam weapon. Suddenly the military upper hand had shifted decisively to the Soviet Union. Now the long-standing plans and preparations for America to be ravished by depression, dictatorship, and war are coming to fruition, but under circumstances drastically changed from those our rulers foresaw. Our rulers are trying to turn some of the events they have set in motion into new channels and are trying to stop others altogether, but the momentum is too great, and they have waited too long blinded by their own greed and lust for power. It is as if the driver of a car traveling 60 miles an hour suddenly saw a cliff 10 feet ahead. He might slam on the brakes and slow down slightly, or he might turn the steering wheel to change the car's direction, but it would make no difference. He would still go over the cliff. Today. The American economy is turning increasingly sour by the day. The slow-motion crash of the stock market that began three years ago is speeding up. Stagflation is deepening as unemployment remains high while inflation gathers steam. The dollar is sick, sinking almost daily on international currency markets. Meanwhile gold which United States Treasury propaganda has declared to be obsolete for monetary purpose, is on its torturous way up. The conspiracy against the dollar by our own rulers, which I described in my book five years ago, is now yielding fruits of international monetary unrest, potential protectionist measures, and economic controls. Angry coal miners are extending their strike so long in the midst of an unusually severe winter that utilities are beginning to run low on fuel. And now the nation's farmers, caught between high prices for what they buy and low prices for what they sell, are also striking. Originally these and other economic disruptions were to be used to help set the stage for implementation of a corporate socialist new constitution that has already been written for America. But now there's no time for such niceties, and our rulers are preparing to use these things to help launch a new Bolshevik revolution right here in the United States. And to help do the job, already over 15,000 of the old Bolshevik faction who are now being expelled from the Soviet Union have flooded into the United States, all in a period of only three months since the Battle of the Harvest Moon. Last month I explain why this is being done. Meanwhile, the aftermath of America's catastrophic loss of the Battle of the Harvest Moon is creating violent cross-currents and confusion, especially in matters of defense and foreign policy. On one hand, the controlled Carter Administration is trying to keep Moscow happy by seeming to comply with Soviet orders to dismantle our defense establishment under the banner of the Strategic Arms Limitations Talk. Yet on the other hand, our rulers are doing everything possible to stall while trying to hurriedly throw together something of significance to counter the overwhelming Soviet military might. As a result, contradictions are all around us these days. On one hand, a government study suddenly emerges announcing the conclusion that nuclear war is unwinnable. Then Jimmy Carter reveals a budget that reflects this thinking with great cuts in critical strategic areas, 
and on the other hand the funding of tactical weapons which cannot attack the Soviet Union is increased, and the package is sold to the public as the NATO budget. Now, while Jimmy Carter is busy abandoning NATO by throwing away things the Europeans would like to have, Secretary of State Vance visits Turkey and Greece in an effort supposedly to shore up and strengthen NATO's eastern flank. And in the Middle East our rulers are now trying to halt the diabolical plan to ignite war which they themselves set in motion, and in this new situation with the alliance with the Soviets gone, a Middle East war would be damaging to them instead of helpful. The State Department is now trying to stop the sequence of events set in motion by certain circles in the CIA which are leading to war. Most of all, they want to deny to the Soviet Union any pretext for a larger conflict that will destroy the United States. If the Kremlin were still being run by the cautious rules of Leonid Brezhnev, our rulers might buy some time with these efforts, but in recent weeks a dramatic and important change has taken place, and the result may well be to cut short the pathetic behind-the-scenes maneuverings of our secret rulers. Topic No. 2 For 13 years and more Leonid Brezhnev headed the Soviet Union. When his own Cuban missile adventure under the authority of Nikita Khrushchev failed and humiliated Russia in 1962, Brezhnev adopted a policy of cautious but determined step-by-step -step advancement in Soviet power. As the boss of the Kremlin, this is the approach Brezhnev followed, patiently and doggedly. The crowning stroke of this approach was so-called détente, a lie which our own rulers wrongly thought would ultimately work to their own benefit in the struggle for world domination in secret alliance with the Soviet Union. But as early as 1973 Brezhnev had to defend his patient détente approach to a strong faction in the Politburo who were becoming increasingly impatient to throw off the charade. They wanted to subdue the hated United States once and for all by swift and sudden military force, but Brezhnev successfully defended his own approach, pointing out that by pretending to be genuinely in league with America's ruling circles, the Soviet Union was being handed money, food, technology and territory at a tremendous rate at no cost other than continued patience. Most telling of all, he reminded them of the many Soviet programs which were developing advanced military technology to leapfrog past the United States, programs which were unknown to America's ruling circles. In 1973 these were not yet ready but soon they would be deployed, tested, and produced in sufficient numbers to create a decisive shift in the military power balance. Brezhnev got his way, but not without a continuing undercurrent of pressure from the KGB and military complex in the Kremlin. They were especially nervous about the secret American moon base for the reasons I explained in detail last September. They were afraid that Russia might fail to beat the United States in the crucial particle beam weapons race with disastrous results, and they knew that the CIA was planting huge Super ICBM missiles under the sea to threaten the Soviet Union from practically invulnerable resting places in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. As I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, they knew that ultimately the secret game plan of America's real rulers called for a double-cross and the destruction of the Soviet Union after America had been brought to its knees in a carefully programmed nuclear war. Finally a blend of viewpoints became the guide for Kremlin policy. Brezhnev's program called Détente would be continued to extract maximum benefit from it. Meanwhile. Preparations would also be set in motion for a first strike 
a surprise attack before the secret American moon base could possibly be ready with its planned particle beam installations. The target date was June 1976. It would not be an ICBM attack, but an attack with zero warning time from within the territorial waters of the United States, and the principal targets would be naval targets. It would be a strike from an unexpected direction with an unexpected strategy, and afterward the entire conventional nuclear arsenal of missiles, planes, and submarines would still be in reserve, discouraging any American attempt at retaliation. The Soviet underwater missile crisis of 1976 is history now, even though the government still has never told you about it. My AUDIO LETTERS FROM No. 14 ONWARD chronicle the details of the crisis and how public exposure ruined the crucial element of surprise preventing the attack at that time. But I have also detailed for you the manner in which then-President Gerald Ford knuckled under and threw away what turns out to have been America's last chance in a military sense. A combination of public exposure, honesty, and firmness could still have prevented war because the coming decisive shift in the military balance had not yet taken place. That chance is now gone forever. Prompt actions of the right kind by the controlled Carter Administration beginning a year ago might still have been able to prevent disaster, but instead the Administration has been doing all the wrong things at breakneck speed. Now Soviet underwater missiles infest our territorial waters including even the Great Lakes. Both Soviet land and underwater nuclear mines, about which I first began warning last April, now are planted ready to destroy dams, reservoirs, riverfront facilities, locks, dams, and bridges along our waterways, key governmental and military installations, grain elevators, factories, and other targets. Manned Soviet Cosmos interceptor satellites are orbiting the Earth armed with particle beam weapons, having already demonstrated their ability to destroy our spy and early warning satellites. The moon now belongs to the Soviet Union, and it bristles with particle beam weapons aimed at the Earth. And Soviet hovering platforms, now all manned and armed with particle beam weapons, are floating at this very moment over North America and other select locations worldwide. Against this background of a decisive catastrophic shift in the military equation in favor of Russia, an important change has taken place in recent weeks within the Kremlin itself. For over six weeks since December 8, 1977, Leonid Brezhnev has been virtually out of sight, reportedly due to illness. The story is that he has been weakened by complications from Russian flu and that this is the reason he has not been meeting with visiting foreign ministers or appearing in public for several weeks. Even a letter was sent to West Germany a few days ago canceling a major visit there by Brezhnev, again supposedly because he needs rest. But my friends, Leonid Brezhnev did not merely have complications from the flu, but also acute leukemia and lung cancer as well. By New Year's Day he was completely incapacitated. So for all intents and purposes, the Kremlin leadership is now in the hands of the Hawks. Intelligence sources have noticed in recent weeks that the Kremlin seems to be suddenly more adventuresome, bolder, and unconcerned about what the United States or anyone else may say about their aggressive moves. For example, a massive Soviet airlift of arms to Ethiopia is underway and the Russians are flying through the airspace of any country they choose, as if daring anyone to stop it or complain. The reason, my friends, is that now the military and KGB complex are now in control, and they are very eager to flex their muscles. They all belong to that secret new ruling circle that controls the Kremlin today I told you about two months ago. But the change in tactics is as dramatic as the contrast between Brezhnev's détente speech and the violent belligerence of his Defense Minister's speech side by side 
on November 7, 1977, in Red Square. Also, as I told you last month, the Soviet campaign of intimidation of America is already underway, and it's increasing. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 29 last month, seven floating platforms armed with particle beam weapons had already been deployed over the United States in locations which I gave you. Today there are twelve over American territory, including one each over Hawaii and the Panama Canal, plus one over Canada. More about that later. I revealed in detail last month how Platform No. 1, hovering over the Atlantic Ocean east of Charleston, South Carolina, used defocused particle beams to produce violent air blasts or air quakes off Charleston and also off the New Jersey coast. By January 12, earlier this month, Platform 1 had moved inland to hover over a spot about 10 miles west of Raleigh, North Carolina, and from there it again created a series of blasts off Charleston described by some witnesses as, quote, the worst yet, unquote. The new adventurers in the Kremlin have also begun setting off more and more of the nuclear mines which have been planted all around our country. There are slightly more than 10,000 grain elevators of all sizes and descriptions in the United States. Of these, however, a much smaller number can be considered major elevators, and only 89 are export elevators. They are critical components in our nation's food supply. The day I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 29 last month on December 22, two grain elevators suddenly exploded, one near New Orleans, the other at Tupelo, Mississippi. Both were caused by Soviet sabotage, and as I pointed out in my tape, the explosion at New Orleans came four months after I warned publicly of the Soviet nuclear mines along the Mississippi River. In the wake of additional grain elevator explosions, we have heard an avalanche of governmental words about low humidity, sparks, and the explosive nature of grain dust. These hazards are real, my friends, but no government official has tried to explain why these hazards, which have always existed, have never before produced a continuing rash of explosions like those of recent days. What's more, listen to these words of a high Agriculture Department official concerning the huge Continental Grain Company elevator that blew up near New Orleans. Quote, the New Orleans operation was considered one of the cleanest. We were very surprised by that explosion, unquote. and the humidity in New Orleans that day was 67 percent. A grain dust explosion? Who's fooling whom? I warned you last month that this was only the beginning due to the extensive Soviet sabotage permitted within our country, and in the past month more grain facilities have been destroyed by Soviet sabotage plus other targets. For example, December 23, 1977, Tunnel 1 to New York near Buffalo, early morning explosion and spectacular fire at the Allied Chemical Company plant on the Niagara River, one man seriously injured, sabotage. December 27, 1977, Galveston, Texas. Grain elevator belonging to Farmers Export Grain Company. Violent explosion heard 70 miles away, followed by fire. 18 killed. Sabotage. January 19, 1978, Liberty, Missouri. Explosion and fire in the grain processing area. Desert Gold Feed Company. Three killed. Six critically injured. Sabotage. January 21, 1978, Duluth, Minnesota, Capital Grain Elevator No. 4, on the waterfront at the west tip of Lake Superior, destroyed by explosion and fire in mid-afternoon. Sabotage. January 23, 1978, near Stevenson, Washington, huge gas line ruptures with an explosion so violent some people nearby think a war has started. Gas pouring from the main creates a torch a mile high and several hundred feet wide, towering into the night sky. Sabotage. That same evening, January 23, Albany, California, near San Francisco, Alcan Metal Processing Plant explodes violently. Huge mushroom cloud rises into the night sky, and many witnesses are convinced at first that a bomb has gone off. 
one man seriously injured. Sabotage. January 25, 1978 Near Sioux Falls, South Dakota Grain elevator destroyed by fire. No injuries. Sabotage. And my friends, there have been many others. What is the purpose of these acts of sabotage? Let me give you the answer of an expert. He is General J. H. Rothschild, R-O-T-H-S-C-H-I-L-D, United States Army retired. Quoting from his famous book, Tomorrow's Weapons, published by McGraw-Hill in 1964, and I quote, Sabotage operations are planned to achieve specific objectives. It does not seem logical, therefore, that in general they would be used during a continuing Cold War situation simply for their nuisance value. Rather, they would be used to break down public confidence immediately preceding the outbreak of hostilities or otherwise tied into an overall design. A sustained campaign of sabotage acts irregularly dispersed with regard to time and area of occurrence can produce a constant build-up of public fear and a complete loss of confidence in authority." Unquote. Thus, my friends, the signs are all around us that we are on the brink of a Soviet surprise attack. Topic No. 3 For generations the Statue of Liberty has stood in New York Harbor, beckoning the poor and the oppressed of other lands to America with the lamp of freedom. Untold millions have sacrificed, struggled, and courted death for the privilege of sailing past her to the Ellis Island Immigration Depot to begin new lives as Americans. In the past, as many as 5,000 immigrants in a single day have entered the United States at Ellis Island in the protective shadow of the Statue of Liberty, and for every single one of them it was an experience never to be forgotten. But today the Statue of Liberty at Ellis Island silently tell a different story. In September 1972, Ellis Island closed its doors to immigrants and is today a national monument to what used to be. While visitors absorb the silent echoes of a bygone era, Ellis Island waits for the moment when it will be demolished by a Soviet hydrogen bomb which has already been planted in the dock area. Likewise the Statue of Liberty now holds aloft not the lamp of freedom but a torch of warning. Within the statue itself another Soviet H-bomb now waits, ready to erase what for millions is the most precious of all symbols of national heritage, the Statue of Liberty. My friends, Soviet saboteurs have planted scores of nuclear mines in the metropolitan New York area, both in the water and on land, and they are still at it, still virtually unhampered. It has now been nine months since I first revealed the Soviet program of nuclear sabotage in the United States, beginning with major western dams and reservoirs. By last June 1977 Soviet nuclear saboteurs were overrunning our country without interference except where Canadian authorities caught them north of our border on information relayed by me. As you know, I temporarily suspended recording the AUDIO letter in an all-out effort to decisively expose and thereby stop the mushrooming Soviet sabotage before it was too late. After a silence of three months, I resumed the AUDIO letter with Issue 25 in August 1977. I told you what I had been trying to do with the cooperation of concerned citizens nationwide. I told you of the official inaction, unwillingness to investigate, and other factors that had defeated these efforts, and I alerted you of the great lengths to which the Soviet sabotage had already gone by then, such as the 158 nuclear mines lurking in the Mississippi River alone, like the one that destroyed the Continental Grain Company grain elevator, 
near New Orleans four months later on December 22, 1977. Now, thanks to Soviet sabotage preparations, grain elevators and other important installations in the United States are exploding and burning with unprecedented frequency. So much so, in fact, that many of these occurrences are now being minimized and even embargoed in the major news media in order to keep the public as a whole from realizing what is taking place and losing confidence in authority. Meanwhile, the Soviet sabotage campaign has now been allowed to proceed so far that nuclear mines are no longer being placed exclusively as strategic targets. Many are now being planted also in non-strategic psychological targets with little or no direct military or economic importance. Thus the Soviet Union is now preparing to engage in the world's first nuclear terrorism. To use New York City again as an example, according to my latest intelligence information, there are over 80 Soviet nuclear mines planted already in and around the five boroughs, 26 in the water, the rest upon land. Among the targets are Rockefeller Center, the Empire State Building, United Nations Headquarters, Columbia University, Fordham University, Bellevue Medical Center, Central Park Reservoir, and other public buildings. Mines also threaten the George Washington Bridge all three legs of the Triborough Bridge, the Queensboro, Manhattan, and Brooklyn bridges as well as other bridges. Railroad tracks and yards are mined, along with several subway stations and the Rapid Transit Station at Yankee Stadium. The Holland and Brooklyn battery tunnels are mined. LaGuardia Airport is threatened by two land mines and a third nearby in Flushing Bay. There is a mine off Willits Point near the Fort Totten Military Reservation and one near the Naval Dry Dock at Bayonne, New Jersey. There is one in Long Island Sound near the United States Merchant Marine Academy and one near the Police Academy Firing Range on Rodman Neck. But sabotage is only one small part of the massive Soviet effort to get ready to make war on the world's proudest nation. For example, in a speech earlier this month, General Richard Ellis, the head of the United States Strategic Air Command, said, and I quote, We are faced with serious concerns over the development and deployment of arms by the USSR. This momentum of growth over the last decade has not been limited to any one system, any one mission, or any one geographical area." Unquote. To illustrate what he meant, General Ellis referred to the supersonic backfire bomber, the Soviet ballistic missile submarine fleet, the world's largest ICBM force, the huge Soviet civil defense program, the tremendous Soviet air defense system, the operational Soviet anti-satellite capability, and the huge and growing Soviet Army with new equipment ready to fight nuclear, chemical, biological, or conventional warfare. General Ellis went on to call attention to the great increase in Soviet war training military exercises during the past year. Quote, this series is the most extensive ever noted, and such activity is now becoming a routine feature of Soviet force and command tests. It reflects the expanse and sophistication of the momentum of Soviet military development." Unquote. My friends, we often hear soothing words about how backward the Soviet Union is compared to the United States. This is true in the area of commercial goods, which is where we put most of our money and know-how. But when it comes to military and scientific development, it's a different story. We tend to forget that the Soviet Union began surprising us in military technology soon after World War II. In 1949 the USSR handed America a nasty surprise by exploding an atomic bomb years before they were expected to do so. 
espionage and help from high places in government and industry played a major role in that surprise, but it still required technological capabilities that were very considerable indeed. Then came Korea and another surprise. Our flyers met it in the air. It was called the MiG-15 Fighter. Over a year ago I told the true story of the Sputnik 1 surprise. We could have beaten Russia, but we did not. In 1961 there was still another shocking surprise. At an air show in Moscow a brand new supersonic twin-engine bomber of advanced design dumbfounded spectators from the West as it roared over their heads. It was unlike anything in the West, and until it flew over our intelligence community did not even know it existed. Today this bomber is still operational and it's called the Blinder by NATO. And so it goes, my friends. By two decades ago Soviet science and military technology were beginning to rival our own, and in some areas were even ahead. And as long as a decade ago highly knowledgeable Americans who visited the Novosibirsk Science City were shaken by what they saw, elaborate up-to-the-minute facilities prosperous surroundings, and a level of scientific expertise that was, quote, kind of scary, unquote, in the words of one such visitor. I've told you in the past how this all came about. It was built up artificially using massive transfusions of technology and economic aid from the West, primarily the United States, but the fact remains it exists and the Soviet Union is no longer under the thumb of those who brought about this transformation. The Soviet Union is now a great Frankenstein monster, and it's turning on its former masters, our secret rulers, to destroy them. And already the Kremlin is making preparations to police a conquered world. Last month I revealed that the Soviet Union had begun operational deployment of floating platforms over the United States and selected other areas worldwide. These platforms, which are not in orbit, are able to hover in a stationary position over any location they choose, as I explained last month. They are an advanced version of the hovering platforms some of our highest military leaders could see on the technical horizon over 15 years ago. Just as happened with Sputnik 1, the United States could have developed such platforms long before the Soviet Union, but did not. Now the Soviets have them, and we do not. The Soviet floating platform, armed as it is with particle beam weaponry, is called the anti-war machine by the Kremlin. By this they are referring to the intended role of the platforms after the United States is destroyed by nuclear war in policing the world under Soviet domination. A small hint of what they can do has been provided recently by the mysterious airquakes along the east coast of the United States in the past six weeks. As I told you last month, these have been caused by defocused particle beam blasts at sea by Platform 1. In focused operation these beams can even destroy American ICBMs in their silos. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 29 last month there were seven floating platforms over our country, four of them manned, the other three waiting for crews to arrive by Electrogravitic Shuttle. Today the number over the lower 48 states has increased to 10, and they are all manned now as are all the rest that are deployed worldwide. The two platforms which last month were off the coasts of Southern California and South Carolina moved inland early this month to respective positions roughly over Hoover Dam and over North Carolina, halfway between Fayetteville and Cape Fear. There also has been some shifting of position among the other platforms. As of tonight, all but one are south of the 40th parallel, which I revealed in May 1976 is the lower boundary of the super-secret nuclear safe zone. 
There is also a platform over southern Alaska, another over the ocean just west of Oahu, Hawaii, and a third directly over the Panama Canal. Four platforms are on stations over Latin America, one each over Brazil, Argentina, Chile, and Bolivia. In Europe, NATO countries are wringing their hands over whether or not the Carter Administration will let them have cruise missiles and neutron bombs for self-defense against the Warsaw Pact forces. But floating overhead now are a string of three Soviet platforms, one over France, the second over Western Hungary, and the third over Turkey. In the Middle East, on-again, off-again peace talks are alternating with accusations and name-calling. Meanwhile, hovering silently overhead at the northwest tip of Saudi Arabia is a Soviet platform able to strike Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Syria. In southern Africa, shouting over our apartheid and majority rule are going on under the eyes of two floating platforms which can now strike targets in Rhodesia and South Africa at will. A third platform is currently stationed over the northern border of Zaire, capable of knocking out the secret West German particle beam development installations in Shaba Province, Zaire. A platform is floating near Lahore, Pakistan. Another is over the west coast of India near Bombay, and when Jimmy Carter was just 800 miles away in Delhi early this month, it blasted an Air India Boeing 747 out of the sky, killing all 213 aboard. There are two platforms over Red China, one in the east, the other in the west near the Lopnor weapons installation. There is a platform over southern Japan, and lately the Japanese are finding the Soviets unbending in negotiations. There is a platform between Indonesia and New Guinea, and there are three over Australia, one in the north, one in the southeast, and one in the west. Finally, there is a platform over the Arctic Ocean northwest of Alaska, and two more over Russia itself for protective purposes. In the past few days the platforms over the United States have started descending to very low altitudes, ranging from 15 to 60 miles. All the other platforms worldwide are remaining at their normal altitudes of several hundred miles with one exception. The platform near Israel has descended tonight to an altitude of 50 miles. There has been no attempt to intercept any of these platforms. One week ago the Soviet Union announced the launching of the first in a new series of spacecraft called Progress 1. Radio Moscow described it as a cargo craft of a new type, a sort of automatic space truck, but a better term would have been space bus. Far from being unmanned as claimed, Progress 1 was launched with nine cosmonauts aboard and the link-up with Salyut 6 is only temporary. Progress 1 is to be the first component of a mammoth new space station to be constructed in space like those the late Dr. Werner von Braun foresaw 25 years ago. Few Americans paid much attention to Progress 1, but Americans and the world were rocked back on their heels just four days ago by an unpleasant new Soviet surprise. On that day, January 24, 1978, an early morning announcement in Washington said that a Soviet nuclear-powered satellite had crashed in northern Canada, and there were worries that it might have spread deadly radioactive contamination on the ground, in the air, or both. But over and over again all day long news reports assured us in breathless terms that there was nothing to get excited about. Even before United States and Canadian search teams were sent to start looking for the remnants of the satellite, National Security Council Chief Rosensky said during his early morning press briefing, quote, This is not a horror scenario. The chances of a real hazard are small, unquote. And yet he also said, We were planning for the worst, unquote. The crashed Soviet satellite, known as Cosmos 954, was described by various reports in the news as a navigation satellite 
an observation satellite, or simply a military satellite. Finally the Government released the official story that it was a spy satellite. So far only the BBC has come close to the truth, calling it a Raider Satellite quote unquote, on January 25. All reports have described it as unmanned, but my friends, it is manned. The story of the Cosmos Killer Satellite 954 began four months ago in September 1977. That month, in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, I revealed that the Soviet Union already had two operational killer satellites in orbit and that they had been used. One, as I mentioned then, was Cosmos 929, launched two months earlier on July 17, 1977. The other was Cosmos 954, the satellite that crashed in Canada a few days ago. For my newer listeners, I should point out that in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 I described in detail the newly operational Soviet killer satellites. That tape was recorded on September 30, before the Government made its first announcement about Soviet killer satellites on October 4, 1977. On that day Secretary of Defense Harold Brown stunned reporters with a totally unexpected announcement during a press conference. He said that the Soviet Union now has an operational killer satellite capability which can destroy our spy satellites. Before Cosmos 954 was launched last September, Cosmos 929, the first of Russia's new fleet of Cosmos interceptors, was already in orbit, undergoing final checkout. Armed with charged particle beam weapons, these destroy target satellites by causing them to erupt into enormous fireballs, a rash of which were reported around the world for a while starting in late September. Cosmos 954 was also a killer satellite, similar to Cosmos 929 except in one respect. Cosmos 954 was armed with a neutron particle beam, and it was intended for a very special task. In September 1977, Cosmos 954 was launched from Tyuri Tam Cosmodrome in the Soviet Union. Cosmos 954 had been rushed into orbit on a crash program to put it into operation at the earliest possible moment. KGB agents at Diego Garcia, headquarters of then America's Secretly Continuing Moon Program, had informed the Kremlin that they would have to act fast. On September 26, 1977, Cosmos Killer Satellite 954 was ready. It began firing its neutron particle beam weapon at the moon, bombarding the American personnel in Copernicus Crater with deadly neutron radiation, just like that produced by a neutron bomb. Through the night and into the next day the bombardment continued, interrupted only when the Earth blocked Cosmos 954's line of sight to the moon. By late in the day of September 27, 1977, the last astronauts in Copernicus Crater were dead. In a stunning upset, the United States of America had lost the most decisive battle of the 20th century, the Battle of the Harvest Moon. Cosmos 954 performed well and did its job in the Battle of the Harvest Moon. But whenever a particle beam weapon is fired, it produces a reaction that disturbs the orbit of the satellite from which it is fired. The Soviet Cosmos interceptors use auxiliary thrusters to correct for this effect, but those aboard Cosmos 954 did not perform perfectly during the Battle of the Harvest Moon, leaving the orbit still needing correction. When these corrections were attempted later, the thrusters malfunctioned and despite repeated attempts by the crew of Cosmos 954 to find and correct the problem, they were unsuccessful. By early December, NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, had detected the orbital troubles of Cosmos 954. A top secret project, Operation Morning Light, was set in motion by the National Security Council to get ready for the crash of Cosmos 954 anywhere in the world, and a possible nuclear disaster as a result of the crash. That is why shortly before Christmas reporters asking the Pentagon about a rumored new Soviet anti-satellite test 
got no answers. The National Security Council had clamped a lid on the story. On the morning of January 24, Cosmos 954 re-entered the atmosphere, streaking over Queen Charlotte Island in northern British Columbia to land in the far north of Canada. The crew capsule of Cosmos 954 with its power pack was designed to survive re-entry, but other parts of the complex satellite were allowed to disintegrate in the atmosphere. As a result, eyewitnesses saw one main object followed by a trail of burning pieces. The main object, brighter and faster than the rest, was the crew capsule, its heat shield causing the air to be heated white hot. It landed safely well to the north of Great Slave Lake at coordinates 64, 47, 27 north, 115, 7, 30 west. That's about 160 miles north northwest of Yellowknife and about 120 miles southeast of Port Radium in an unpopulated area. Cosmos 954 had lost the ability to restore its orbit, but the crew did still have sufficient reentry control to select a landing site not very different from one in the Soviet Union. Unlike American spacecraft, Soviet spaceships always return to land rather than splashing down the way we do. The crew have been in contact with Moscow awaiting rescue, and just as happened in October 1976 when their missile-planting mini-submarine became trapped in Chesapeake Bay, the Soviet Union has again been allowed to recover their stranded military craft without public exposure. A floating platform previously stationed over Ottawa, Canada, picked up the crew and the space capsule this evening at about 7.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is now on its way back toward Ottawa, its battle station. But while the world's eyes have been riveted on the drama in northern Canada, ominous developments have been taking place in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf of Mexico. As I say these words, the Soviet Navy is once again forming a three-pronged pincer movement on the continental United States. The Atlantic Fleet is lined up over a front nearly 1,000 miles long from Connecticut to southern Florida, roughly 200 miles offshore at this very moment. The Pacific Fleet is about the same distance offshore, spread out over a distance of 900 miles from roughly the north tip of California southward. The Gulf Fleet is stretched out over a 750-mile front between the southern tips of Texas and Florida. This is happening at a time when unprecedented storms are ravaging the United States, especially in our industrial heartland of the Midwest. Eleven months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 21 I told you that the strange extreme storms that had just taken place were believed to be the result of a massive Soviet weather modification experiment. I gave a warning that a repetition of such extreme and unusual weather patterns that paralyzed important areas of our country might well precede a surprise attack by the Soviet Union, and at this very moment tonight our country is in the grip of extreme and totally unexpected winter storms which are paralyzing large areas from the Midwest to the Northeast. Even so, the Government isn't about to tell you about the Soviet submarine fleets now deployed around our country. This is especially true now because the Soviet Navy is deployed in such a way as to strongly suggest to our desperate rulers that the Soviets are going to live up to the super-secret Nuclear Safe Zone Agreement which I revealed long ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 12, and that's why as Jimmy Carter and other top government officials converged on the War Room at the Pentagon just today, the cover story given the public is that it is to view, quote, a simulated crisis situation, unquote. My friends, the Russians are now ready. They are ready to destroy America's military and economic resources at a single coordinated blow. They are ready to survive American retaliation, if any, 
and there ready with their floating platforms deployed worldwide, plus their eight particle beam installations on the moon, to begin policing a conquered world. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless and protect each and every one of you.